Good evening, everyone. Thanks everyone for your time this evening, wherever you are in the world. It's, we have quite a, a mixture for people from today. We have um, a lot of South Africans, obviously, as per usual. Um, we have some Canada, America, um, Dubai, UAE, um, Ireland as well. So we have quite a few people all together, which is, which is great. So we've been doing these webinars for the last couple of years now. Um, this is our first of, of this year at the end of the year, but we are starting again some more next year. We're going to be doing quarterly next year. So really, we're here to try and help anybody looking at relocating to the UK um, with as many hints and tips as we can. Some people in the um, screens I recognise. So it's good to see some some names here. Some some beers need to be ordered soon and darts matches, I believe, as well. And they know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> that's <Merv. laughs> uh, good to see you and um so that yeah there's lots of we have a good mixture of people as well we have doctors accountants lawyers retired people engineers surveyors um financial directors um so we have a good mixture of people all looking to move at different different times so look we're more than here we're here to try and help anybody and everybody as we can um, with your moving requirements, whether it's if we can help you, we can just give you some hints and tips. It's purely down to you. More than happy to show you however we possibly can um, get you moving. Um, a lot of people come to us at the end to try and help um, because they've tried themselves and we all know moving internationally um, is extremely difficult, very, very hard. And the market is extremely tough. So hopefully through the presentations we're going to give you, we'll give you some hints and tips from, I cover generally the south of England, Andrew covers more the north of England, but Andrew will talk about himself in a minute. Um, but yeah, that's it, just a brief introduction as to what we do and how we try to, to work. So I've been in business for quite a long time now, 37 years from 1986, as you can just see there. When the world was a different place, we phoned people all the time. We didn't have email. We didn't have, we had fax machines, just about it. Um, so I did 21 years of the state agency, um, cut my teeth there up to a director level. Um, and then in about 2007, I'd flip from the sales side to the letting side. So I've been doing corporate relocation and private relocation since then. So the last 16 going to 17 years now, I've been doing um, that side of things. I've been a landlord for nearly 25 years, so I know what a landlord wants to hear from you. I've been a tenant on and off for 12 years, so I know what a tenant wants to hear from you. And I've also run a lettings and property management department. So I've seen every sort of piece of the puzzle, which helps us when we're building our relationships with our estate agents um, to get them best for you. Because, and I always do this whenever I speak to anybody, if I were to move to wherever you're living, Durban, Cape Town, Ireland, England, America, Canada, wherever. I wouldn't know the local agents. I wouldn't know where to start. I'd have an idea, but I wouldn't know that those relationships that have been built over the years, they, they trust us, know us and like us. So therefore, if we had to move to one of your, your areas, we wouldn't know the agents. We wouldn't know how best to do it. So we really utilise that a lot because there's such a shortage of, of properties, which we're going to come on to later. And most of you will probably know this anyway, such a shortage of properties um, to let. And they have lots of choices. So we have to make sure that we can't always get to see the view and view the properties ourselves. We have to do WhatsApp viewings, video call viewings, um, unless we don't have someone local to, to view. Um, um, but it's pretty rare to get that. So it's highly competitive um, and it's not getting any easier, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully if the market is getting with the um, autumn statement today, hopefully may feel like a few more people have got a bit a few more pounds in their pocket or rands or dollars or whatever um so hopefully we can try and help out with some i say hints and tips there but that's just me um andrew will go through some other bits and pieces of himself in a minute there's my google reviews which i'm very pleased now that i'm up to 70 google reviews and all five stars so thank everybody each of them individually i i am as good as my last review that's all i feel so um nice nice to see some of those names and one of those i think the top comment there from katia does say that um i remain calm and positive which really calmed her down now i'm generally quite calm and positive but i'm more like a swan or a duck so i'm still paddling away yeah. and it's st stressing as such but i won't show it and i won't allow it to be shown even if the client is because it is it's a big roller coaster as all of you know but we are one small part but quite a large part of what we do um, with the move so we're used to that 
And um, so we still value every re review we get. And like I say, we're as good as our last client. Um, so Andrew, you have some new stats first or you're gonna talk about yourself first? Uh, yeah, I'll just, well, I can share the stats. So I'll give yeah. another, I suppose it's probably a bit easier if I share them. Um, two seconds, I'll just click through. It was just obviously the market evolves over the course of the year. Um, I'll put this link in the chat. So it's just myself and Mark were looking a bit earlier at noticing, obviously, we've got the Christmas running. Um, and in effect, it was just saying, oh, we're, we're having a, a bit more success in actually getting through to agents because they, they don't tend to answer the phones much. Um, in terms of pricing, just to give people a gauge on average rents in the UK, uh, in the last quarter, they have gone up. Uh, London pricing is around about the £2,000 mark uh, for an average two-bed, three-bed. Uh, Southwest, around about the 1500 mark. And then the Northwest, I think it's slightly inaccurate, is seven, well, it says 766. Um, we're Manchester-based, so it is a little bit more expensive than that. But if you go up to areas in Burnley or the Ribble Valley, uh, a bit away from the main cities, you'll find the prices do drop a bit. Um, expectations wise, they are expected to increase uh, slightly again, mainly due to lack of supply. Um, I won't go into it, but the main factors driving are increased demand for the rental properties, um, which is because of the lack of rental options. I think we're 46% down from four years ago. Um, and the rising cost of living. So people are kind of opting to, to rent rather than rather than buy a little bit as well. So we can uh, go into more detail on that if it's of interest. It's just an oversight because we get a lot of inquiries saying why are agents not replying to us, et cetera, et cetera. So it's um, just to give you a bit of insight on statistics wise. Uh, as for myself, I've got a few years on Mark. So obviously started back in 2004. Um, that was my first rental property as a landlord. Uh, and then I do invest, it's more of a pension plan. So we uh, provide the investment side from a, from a personal view. So it's an, an interest uh, as well as a job. Uh, hence why it's, uh, we tend to work quite long hours. Um, actually have a master's degree in property. So understand the mechanics of how you'd buy a property and do it up and how it works for both landlord and tenant. And then since 2013, we've been helping people relocate from all over the world so i think what january this year was 10 years and we've done over a thousand relocations um advised on i think over six million in both rentals and sales um and yeah we've 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 kind of a uh, kind of covered a lot of a lot of ground and a lot of knowledge and like to think we provide a good service it is getting a little bit tougher as mark touched on um it's more how to we work in every day so it's how to understand the market and how to work with the agents and also how to pitch about why why our clients should be accepted over over other people applying i think on the uh, latest data 30 people are applying for every property um some will be discounted almost immediately due to affordability criteria um but there's normally five to ten good offers in uh, which makes it difficult for landlords to pick from. So it, it's on us to kind of promote um, people in, in the best light possible to ensure we get accepted. Um, and there's plenty of tips and tricks. We have plenty of resources, happy to share them as well. I mean, our aim is to be as transparent as possible. I think Mark will agree. Um, just to ensure you're fully informed because we appreciate it's it's a life-changing move. So we want to make sure it's it's the right move and you're you're fully informed on what's what's to come, etc. So there's I'm I'm slacking on the reviews. I'm I'm only on forty, so Mark's on sixty. So uh, a bit of catching up to do there. You got several years on me, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, any questions about ourselves, about the property market, um, anything in particular? I know pets are often a big one. Um, are welcome and we'd like to think we can answer them if we can't we generally know someone who can and happy to hand over to Dirk to share his wisdom on visas 
uh, courtesy of Brighton Bats, who I know do a great job for visas and immigration. Yeah, thanks, Mark, Andrew. Um, thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, one thing I must say, you know, in reading on reading your experiences and your Google reviews is I should probably get busy and buying a property or something for myself. Eh? I'm getting behind the trend, but it's but it's fine. It's fine. We'll we'll deal with that some other time. In any case, um, thank you to all in the audience. Um, as you see there, my name is Dirk and I am an immigration consultant at Brayton Bus. Um, <clears throat> following the trend a little bit more about myself, before I started, you know, working in the in the landscape of immigration, I was a lawyer in South Africa, spent a bit of time in the normal South African practice, ended up in the immigration um, landscape and I've been doing this for quite some time now. So um, a little bit more about Brayton Bus from our side, we are UK immigration specialist, so we only deal with the UK. We can help with anything, you know, based for the UK from your normal visit to visa right up to your, you know, corporate business immigration and all of that. So um, I don't know, Mark, Andrew, if you guys want me to run through a bit of a um, bit of the changes in immigration at the moment, or should we keep that for a bit later? I think it's certainly good because there's there's a lot of things have changed, do change. I mean, I, I know from your website that we were looking at for a few days ago. A lot, there's so many variations of the visas that you can get, as you know, mm -hmm. we here of like tier two ancestral spousal visas and things like that. But maybe coming into, yeah, the costings and things like that is a good idea. Just an overview and wait for some. I've got some other questions as well from people. But if anybody wants to drop something in the chat box, please do. But yeah, carry on. Don't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, guys, if we look at um, the news and immigration this year, the, the biggest news, you know, that's got everyone on the edge of their seat has to be the you know fee increases now some of you on here tonight might have seen that but on 4th of october this year you know the application fee for all visa routes has gone up between 15 and 20 percent for all you know visa categories so that's already been implemented we're working with that already the far bigger news here is that and on 16 january give or take you know that's the proposed date the immigration health surcharge will also be raised and that's going to be raised by a staggering 67 percent so that is a massive add on your you know cost of immigrating to the uk so it's more important now than ever to to set up everything correctly from the start you know to get to make sure you know you have all that you need to affect this immigration your visas arrive timelessly and also you know tying in with what mark and andrew is doing i know that it's a very very big um, cause of stress for most clients that I deal with, um, you know, relocating but not having anywhere to go once you get that side. And a lot of clients that have done that, you know, have found that once you get that side, you are going to struggle to, you know, to find the perfect place for yourself. And you often, if you have, you know, the, the capacity or the option to take something, it might not be what you envisioned or what you would want to like. And that is why it's very important, you know, to plan all of these things um, beforehand. So, just, just take note of that that fee increase, as I said, 16 January 2024 seems to be when it's going to happen. All applications going in before that date will still make use of the old uh, immigration health surcharge fee. And for some of you that don't know what the immigration health surcharge fee is, that is essentially your payment for the use of the NHS in the UK. Um, you know, you, you'll then be able to use the NHS, NHS same as any other British citizen. So that I think is the biggest thing to take note of in this year in immigration. A few other, you know, things that happen in immigration this year, or a few updates rather that I'll be giving you is, if we look at something that also happened and was big news fairly recently was the passing of a new Nationality and Borders Act for the, for the UK. So a lot of clients, you know, have now had the opportunity to pursue registering as a British citizen where they could not do it before. Now, we've, we've been almost a year, or it is more than a year down the line since that has been passed and we are getting you know, feedback on applications now. So it's a bit more clarity at the moment. These applications take very long because of the fact that the Home Office is so inundated with incoming applications. So just a bit of an update on that. It is slowly turning the wheel. So you know, if, if there's still anyone out there that wants to have a look at that, you're welcome you know, to, to reach out and, and we can have a look. And then, um, you know, the other thing, the, old, the only other thing I can say is, you know, we're nearing the end of the year. Um, we're nearing the Christmas period, so it is. It's it's important, you know, to get everything 
to get all your planning in line now. Because even though, um, I mentioned it earlier to Mark and Andrew, even though the Home Office does not officially close with applications, so things tend to take a bit longer over this holiday period, you know, and also stemming a bit into the January period. So it is important to reach out and see, you know, what can be done at the moment to have a look at that. Um, and one thing that I also foresee if we look at previous trends is when the Ukraine and Russia situation took place, if, no, it didn't come to a standstill, the immigration spectrum, but it nearly doubled in time that it would take you to get everything. So um, I also foresee something like that with the new Israeli crisis. Um, I don't think it's going to be as severe, but just take note of that. We might see some delays in the near future with that, but obviously you can, you can, you know, um, keep a note, keep a watch on our socials and all of that. You can also, you know, reach out to Mark Andrew directly. They'll put you in touch with me and we can chat about it a bit more. Uh, just before I hand over to, to Mark and Andrew again, I see that one question came in there about the actual pound amount of the, I should, I should, I should say sterling amount, right? That's how we, we speak in, in the UK. But in any case, so the, the increase there is at the moment, you're looking at about 624 pounds per year, going up to 1,035 pounds per year. And then for children, that's, a, that's for the adults. For children, we looked at 40, 470 pounds a year at the moment, going up to 776 per year next year. Um, one important thing to note there is that these fees are payable upfront for the length of your visa meaning if you go for three four five year visa it'll automatically be multiplied by your term in the uk and you have to pay that upfront so as you guys can see it's a huge huge one to to pay off the bat it's worth it in the end but it is a big cost at the at, from the start so it does place a lot of stress on people with their application so it is is very important now more than ever to make sure that we can get it right that first time because obviously the 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 effect of if you get a refusal based on something like this is now it's going to cost you a lot more money if you got that refusal to try and do something like this again but in any event enough of me mark andrew over to you guys again for um for some discussions oh that's great thank thanks dirk for that that's incredible amount that's a crazy amount isn't it unbelievable um, but no, thank you for that. I had a question. It was just from somebody asked me a couple of days ago, so I was going to bring this into it. It didn't get um, asked. We've got somebody moving over. I think it's March, April time on an ancestral visa. Is there a kind of like, I mean, when we speak to people, we, we like to try and work with people two to three months in advance if we can. That's the perfect time we can do if when people are looking to move. But is there a best time to try to, because obviously you have different types of visas, when is, is it? A month, two, three, six. What? When's the best time to at least have a chat with you and just, you know, look at the situation? Yeah, look, Mark. It's going to depend really on what type of visa you're going to to be going for. Let's take something like the ancestral visa, for instance. You know, a normal ancestral visa once you've applied takes about three to four weeks. Um, you know, processing time for you to get the visa. So that's quite quick. It's one of the quicker ones that you can get. Okay. One of the other things that the Home Office you know, specifies in their rules is you can apply for these visas, and this applies to nearly all, nearly all of the visas, say for student visas, that you, you can apply for up to three months before you want to travel to the UK. So say we have the scenario that you want to, you want to travel on the 1st of April 2024. You can apply from March, February, you know, so uh, from January. So, so you see, you can pl plan your, your immigration to the UK. If it comes to you know getting in touch, well, I would say you know three months is more than more than enough time to sort something like this out and get everything into um, into perspective. But if we look at other types of visa, something like a spousal visa, something like a skilled worker visa, that's going to take a bit more time. You know, if you look at the skilled worker visa, you have to have a job offer from a UK company that is licensed to accept migrant workers. That may take some time. Then you have something like a spousal visa, where we have a significant financial requirement, which is not difficult to meet, but it's quite difficult to evidence with the documents that you have to prove. So that might also take some time to get into place. So I think, you know, the, the honest answer here, guys, is if you are looking at going over to the UK or making that step for immigration in the next year, you know, it wouldn't hurt to reach out to see, you know, what type of timelines, because at least, you know, we can tell you, Okay, I see you going this and this and this route. 
let's have a chat and this and this and this debt. Or I see you doing this, let's make sure you have this in place before you know you go to all of these. Because we have to also look at the additional costs that you're going to be paying for all of this, apart from the visas, English testing, TV testing, stuff like that. And that all goes into a certain time frame. So we have to we have to look at that. But in, in short, uh, Mark, I would say if you're looking at going in 2024, would be a good thing to reach out now. Okay, no, that's that seems fair enough. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, do you, do you get do many people are they more on tier two skilled workers in Manchester area, or just again a mixture like all of us we have? Everybody's different. Uh, yeah, it tends to be skilled workers. Um, it'll be normally if it's family, for example, the the husband or the wife will have the job, um, and then the the spouse is coming and trying to find a job. So we'll um, obviously there is agents who can help with job finds um my wife uses one as a teacher and um, so i can we, we try and help out where we can i suppose it's like i say it's finding a property is is probably the most important thing but there's so many different elements that come with moving to a new country so yeah that's generally what we find people are, are coming on the tier two visas currently yeah. That's fair enough. There's a great question for you to answer, Dirk. So I have no idea <laughs> when somebody was born in Zimbabwe at six at, at six twenty two. Um, it's quite a detailed one there for you. Yeah, I was I was actually going to type on that one now, but it's but it's good that we can quickly chat on it. So you know, with with the with the new nationality and borders bill, the biggest question is yes, it does come into play where you were born and where your parents were born. But the biggest thing up that comes into play is was there and this will apply to 80 to 90 percent of the cases was there a maternal link somewhere in your um your ancestral lineage to the uk the reason why that's so important is the new nationality and borders um bill slash act was you know specifically drawn up for people that was affected by historical legislative injustice and if we look back at that you know pre-1983 a British woman could not pass on her citizenship directly to her children, which they've now tried to rectify. So now we're sitting with scenarios, you know, that it not only trickles down to the first person in the lineage, but it can possibly to, um, trickle down to the second person in the lineage, meaning that if your grandparents stems from the UK, you normally would have the ancestral visa route um, available to you, and that's the only one. Now, we do have the option of looking into that to see if that's an, you know, if, if it's going to be, or if the client's going to be eligible to apply for citizenship directly to apply to register as a citizen. So, you know, the short answer to that is that um, there might be a chance in that specific scenario. So, you know, I, I would I would say anyone who has that question can reach out to me directly and we can run a, um, a quick inquiry for them through our nationality department because of the fact that they will require a bit more information than that stated there. But in short, that qualifies for an ancestral visa could potentially trickle down to a um, citizenship application. Wow. It's just so complicated to me. It just seems how anybody would do it themselves is just beyond me. So um, good answer. Um, next question. Once your visa has been approved, do you have to arrive in the UK within 90 days? Because I think I get it when we, people have a BRP, they have to they have a 90 day window to arrive. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You know, it used to be 30 days in the past. Since we had the COVID situation, they prolonged that to a 90 day period. So all visas now, you know, if you if it, from the day that you ask them to make your visa valid for you have 90 days to enter the uk for the first time that is known as the entry clearance period so so that is absolutely true that statement um a little bit of an advice there there's rumors going around in the mall that they're going to change that back to 30 days soon but oh, really? you know um, we we will be informed you know and, and you'll also be um, able to see that on our socials if that happens okay that's right so did that come in just before brexit um not brexit sorry wrong one um covid yeah so, so the 90 day thing came in just before covid and um, before covid you know we had only 30 days as your entry clearance okay. now you from from the time that we have covid it was it what the, the initial you know reasoning behind it is they wanted to to make it a 90 day period for in in order for someone to kind of arrange you know the flights because there wasn't a lot of flights all of that but now they didn't change it back because it seemed to be working people have a bit more of a time planning schedule, they can, you know, get their fares in order before they go to the UK. So that's, um, at least that's what I think happened there. 
Fair enough, that's fine. And then next question, two British passport holders. Can you see that one, Doug? Yeah, I've got it here in front of me. So, family of two British passport holders, holders, two Irish passport holders. No, no NHS needed. You know, they're both, um, if, if, if you look at them in that aspect, British citizens, um, people with permanent residence in the UK, people with status under the European Union Settlement Scheme and Irish citizens can simply, you have the right to live and work in the UK. So no, you know, NHS payments available or needing to be done, no visas needing to be done. So you can, you can just hop over and go and live your life in the UK. Excellent. I think that's what they wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in light of the new information, obviously the increase in prices, Dirk, I imagine ancestral visa is well if the opportunity is there is the best way forward is that right yeah look it's i would say it's the best way forward if you do it now before that increase remember yeah. if we look at something like an ancestral visa um let me put it like this ancestral visa is actually one of my favorite visas because it's the most most flexible visa that you can get for the UK. You have full right to work from the start. You know, you can work wherever you want to open your own company, full right to live and you have it for the full five years. Um, after the five years, of course, if you meet certain requirements, you can apply for your indefinite leave to remain. Now, the reason why I say it is important to apply for that this year before that um, increase comes in is because it's a five year visa, you're going to be, be, be paying five years worth of NHS payments from the start. So, if you do that now, you're going to be potentially saving more than £2,000 on your NHS only per person. Whereas if you hold that off to next year and you go from, you know, let's say February onwards, that is £2,000 more per person. So if you look at something like a family of five, you can see it's going to cost you a lot more money. But I agree with you, Andrew, in terms of the, uh, of the choice that you have, ancestral visa is by far one of the most popular um, options if you have the eligibility to do that. Mer Mervyn, that's great. 52 years away and then came back seamlessly. That's perfect, isn't it? Exactly what you'd like as well. That's what you want, what you hope for. That's good. Um, yeah. Andrew, did you want to go over what go over one of your case studies? You had quite a few to go through. Did you want to pick one and I can pick one as well, just to run through some? Yeah, yeah. can do. Do you, do you want to take us off, Mark? I'll just put it on it. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you run with that. Can we have, okay, no, that's fine. So there's there's several different case studies we've all come up with. I've just not picked one in, in particular. There's somebody from last year that moved into and it was they were paying upfront rent. Now, not everybody get asked to or can afford to pay upfront rent because it's expensive here anyway, as you know. Um, but this particular person were able to offer nine months in advance rent on the offer. Now, we got on very well with the agent, very well with the landlord. The landlord actually said, I don't want nine months up front because you'll push me over my tax limit for the <laughs> tax allowances for that year. So we actually managed to get, it was quite a complicated one with dogs and cats and grandparents and lots of children, et cetera, et cetera. So there was quite a lot to, we were trying to incentivize the landlord to accept us, but he said, look, I really like the fact you have the means to pay me nine months in advance, but I don't need it all in one go. So we can either pay it quarterly or monthly. The tenant was absolutely over the moon. The landlord was very, very happy, but he just shows you this, different ways where we can not just use the upfront payment because a lot of these people won't get unless they get to meet you which are not going to they they've got to know like and trust us essentially so that's what they're burning on because they know when we registered with some agencies a particular agent called leaders and romans in the uk which are quite a big well-known agent i've been registered with them i worked against them since 1987 basically and uh, when I registered with them, they say to me, oh, if I don't know the person, are you are, are you on our mailing list? I said, just check my record. They're like, oh, wow, yeah, you're on here hundreds of times. They're like, yeah, I do this for a living. It's in my living. Um, so I know when I'm asking you a question, I'm professional. We know what we're talking about. I've got a real client. And then we get a bit of gravitas because they know we're relocation property finders. So they give us a little bit of extra treatment. They can't guarantee to us, but they know we come with really good clients. And when... When we come really good clients, they will always pitch to their landlords when they're pitching for the business versus the competition that we deal with all the corporate agents and the, you know, estate, uh, corporate people coming over, have good 
jobs. They're very safe, they're very sound. And we have these people who have a tier one, tier two skilled worker visa or ancestral or, or whatever it is, they like the fact, don't have to pay up front. As long as you're working and having a job paid within the UK, they don't like it when you're not paid in the UK, but that's a, a different one again. So all these things just help smooth the process. And it's just how we, those relationships we've all built up between me and Andrew over many decades of, of working with people and being the agent as well, and being a landlord, being a tenant, we just know how to best put it forward. It's not always, we can't always get the deal agreed over in, in one day. We have to do it in bite-sized chunks, but we can be quite confident slash pushy, not arrogant, hopefully, with the agents. But if someone does it from another country with a different accent, we have an accent as well, obviously, um, then they maybe don't take it the right way because they don't know the person. They just don't know what they're saying. But we, we just know what to say. We know when to say it, how to say it and when not to say it as well. So um, it's more just about the relationships with the agents. But we could have picked a, a couple. That was just one that I picked up from last year. Yes, Mark. Uh, yeah, for me, it was more the um, well, a family one, and also how to work the system in a way. It's um, it's a lovely family moving to Cheshire. Uh, they're actually arriving January the first, twenty twenty four. Um, we'd found the property for them. It comes available November twenty sixth. So obviously, no landlord wants a a, sat, a property sat empty for six weeks. So we had to negotiate pretty hard on that. Uh, we came up with a date of December the 19th to officially start the tenancy. Um, but, but one of the provisos was that we need all the legal paperwork before Dece December the 7th, uh, mainly because of the secondary school applications. So I don't know how familiar people are with primary and secondary schools in the UK, but there's certain dates, which are cut-off dates, to get your applications in for the next academic year. Um, so this December the 7th is is the date that we need to have legal paperwork to show we're living in that area to be accepted into the nearby high school. Um, so we're, we're effectively getting the paperwork tomorrow. So all payments have been done. We've pushed all the referencing through quickly um, so we can actually get that in and get accepted for the school we want rather than going having to go in through a, an in-year catchment, which effectively means you get put in any school with availability. Um, and then the second tweak on this one was both the, the family members will still be working for South African companies. Uh, so they're asking for six months rent up front. We were able to work it because the wife, uh, what's well, called Natalie, uh, it's a global company. So through doing the UK referencing, we were able to pick up the company and rather than having to pay six months rent up front, uh, through myself negotiating with the agent, we tweaked it to put the whole rent through on Natalie's salary alone, which equated to rather than having to pay six months up front, they can now pay month to month. So it's a lot nicer way of working it, but it's only through that knowledge you kind of learn to ask the right questions um, to make sure we can uh, make it happen. So that was yeah quite a nice one to end the year. And John is actually flying in on business next week. Uh, so I'm meeting up with John. I'm going to view the property. So, yeah, a good, a good result and a, a nice one to end the year on because there's always a – every case is different. So it's always thinking the best way forward. And there's always a hurdle or two. And it's only through experience, I suppose, you get to kind of uh, work out how to get over them hurdles. Mm, very true. Very true. Um, we've got some more here now. Guarantee, is it better to have a guarantor on your lease or to show you have the means to pay your fund? That's a great question. Um, someone's cooking dinner in the background there. <laughs> um, so is it better to guarantor on lease? Now, you, so as, as many things as you can, because a landlord can be risk averse if, the, if someone's coming from abroad to rent a property. You don't have to have a year up front. You don't have to have a guarantor. But if, you, if you're working in the UK, as mo they prefer you to be being paid into the UK in a salary as such. And if you're being come over on a skilled worker visa, that's even better. If you can show you have a guarantor, I have a couple next um, in January coming over where his job starts, sorry, in February actually starts. And um, the boss is gonna be a guarantor, it's quite rare, uh, but it's good to know because obviously he's employing him to come over. So that's great to have that. And it's just another 
insurance policy from a landlord's perspective, if he's competing against 30, 40 other people from that local area, if he can pay a little bit up front, that's great. But if you've got that guarantor, it negates that limit to where you say you had to do it. I thought of another case study I was going to mention as well, where I had a guy who was literally distraught, came to me oh, in early spring, summer this year. He had three months up front he could pay. Um, his wife was over here already, his dog and his family and his kids were back in SA. She was a teacher. She couldn't accept a job because she wasn't here. He was, and I said to him on my Zoom call, I said, if you were local to me now, I would take you for a beer because you would he was <laughs> so stressed. He really was so stressed. He really needed to, um, to try. So I said, let me just try and speak about how we can do some options. We managed to say, look, if you can get a guarantor, that'd be great because of your situation. If you can pay six, maybe 12 months in advance, let me try and leverage that 12 months six to 12 months upfront rent and we got a deal agreed with an agent i know very well to pay six to 12 months up front but again the landlord said you know what just pay me quarterly the first quarter in advance and then monthly just want to check that, that he was happy first of all so you just break it down but by having that flexibility to say we could pay up to 12 months in advance just gives you just knocks the other people out of the park as well as maybe having a guarantor, as well as they know us and trust us, etc. So there's many ways to, to, to make it work. It's not just one thing that it's not just a case as Andrew knows, making one phone call to an agent and luckily getting an offer agreed. Andrew, oh well, Andrew can tell you how many calls he can make sometimes to make one or two viewings. It's just it's a ridiculous number of calls, it really is. Um, and we know who we're talking to as well. So that's crazy. So if you have a, if you can have a guarantor, it's normally a UK based homeowner that they want it's nice to have it's not a necessity but generally if it's for most people that if you don't know the way they generally work out the affordability is 30 times the monthly rent so if you're renting for a thousand pounds a month your salary needs to be thirty thousand pounds a year if it's just above a guarantor i think is 36 times they need to be thirty six thousand pounds a year um, but that's just the rough it if you if you've got if you're on 50 60 thousand pounds and you're going for a thousand pound a month and you have a guarantor and you can pay up front, you're bulletproof, you know, but not everybody has that option. So we use as many options as we can to try and we try and save you money. We, we want to, if you can pay that six to 12 months up front, I use it as leverage to try and get through the front door, to get the viewing, to get things agreed. Then I try to renegotiate very carefully, very, very carefully <laughs> if we can, so we don't lose the deal, but we've got to be, smart pushy confident not arrogant but we can be that pushy whereas you guys couldn't be that pushy um they would not um let you get away with it but we can they you they know we're being they pushy. Do it they used to it um so that's what we're just trying to do but it was just another sorry i went off on a tangent there with a case study <laughs> but it was just referred to the guarantor part and up front and when they moved in the end he was just so over the moon it was, it was unbelievable it's just a different way to make it happen so we didn't spend all his money i didn't want to spend all his money but i just needed to use the the threat that we can put more money into it if we need to but then the landlord likes us the agent liked us and we sort of backtracked so brilliant it was really um so the more things we can have the better but we can't we can't do a, do it on every time uh successful how successful can we be in securing a rental with two pets? I think the main answer is it depends on the pets. I mean, I if, if there are pets coming, I'll always ask for a pet CV, of which we'll provide an example, and the yeah. cutest picture possible of your cat, dog, rabbit, whatever it may be. Um, and we try and be transparent with the agent. We'll try it's and one I prepared it. earlier that will look something. There you I go. I'm not sure if you can... I think you can you can't see it because of that, but just roughly, just something with some images, some pictures, and um, yeah, you know where that shows. <laughs> it's, it's uh, so yeah, the, the the long and short of it is, it depends on the pet. Uh, it may be, for example, people work from home, so you can push that working from home, so the dog's not left alone, so it's not barking annoying neighbors, for example. So there's loads of things you can you can work on. The agent from an angle uh summer blanket no pets because the landlords had a bad experience of having pets previously so there's kind of no negotiation um i don't know how how mark approaches it i try and do the viewing build the rapport and then drop in about the pets um 
Yeah, we 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 we. Uh, it depends on the time. If if it if it says pets allowed, a lot of agents don't advertise pets allowed because if they do that, they'll just get swamped with like a hundred people because there are so many people with pets. I think during COVID, I think I think England has something like 66 percent people have pets. Something of that kind of you know yeah. numbers. It's two thirds of people, um. So they have to be a little bit more um resilient to that fact as well. But with most people, if it says no pets allowed we could maybe squeeze one cat or dog and <laughs> if it's multiple i've got a client at the minute we're just trying to find a household we nearly thought we'd agreed something today um we've got two cats and one dog she said oh it won't be a problem and then earlier this uh, later this afternoon she said oh just just don't mention the cats at the moment They're like we, we can't do that we, we i've got my client's money here and we've, we've got to look after them we can't we can't just not mention the cats is it agreed or is it not agreed because it's with multiple pets it's so many more times harder again as, as we know but um with we we've got we, we we rent a house and we had two cats we now adopted a third so we now got three cats so when we move again it'll be a complete nightmare i know it will be even though we know all the agents um it will be horrific very 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 very, very hard but um it, if it does say pets allowed then yeah they are normally swamped with people but if they don't say pets allowed we try to get maybe one pet in because and again we use our position of relocation agents and property finders that we can you know have like we're one up on another tenant we have a better client allegedly um but it's just it's super tough so yeah cats or, or dogs um depends on the landlord if, if they if they've got a cat or a dog or if they've had a problem in the past with a cat or a dog that can depend as well i mean i've had people a corporate job many years ago we had two labradors and I did the viewing face to face. So I, I was out with them for the day. It's a different scenario. I didn't tell them we had um, dogs first of all, because I wanted them to to love their clients first. They had no kids, but the wife is at home with the dogs, the two Labradors. But we then found out that they'd had a dog previously at, in, um, I think, Norwich, it was northeast England. And um, they'd wrecked the house. A puppy had wrecked the house. And that's why. So we had to pay a little bit more extra. Um, we couldn't pay more deposit because you can't pay any more than the five week deposit. If anybody ever gets asked for more than five week deposit, you're not allowed. They are not allowed to accept or we're not allowed to offer more than five weeks. But what sometimes will happen, and this is more in the summer and last year, maybe people would pay a little bit over on the monthly rent to cover the deposit as such. So maybe put another £25 a month, sometimes £50 a month to cover having pets um just quite a popular but it's it's dropped off a bit than last summer was just crazy so bad with that so bad yeah. it's the same up here it's quite common if they can't kind of push back on the pets yeah our, our backup is offering a little bit more which i know is not ideal um but that you're not allowed to charge any more than the five week deposit anymore are you where it used to be double deposit for pets so that's the way the agents get around it. I've put twenty five pound off a month or something like that. So yeah, yeah, it used to be if you if you rented, you had a six week deposit. If you had pets, you had to pay eight week deposit. And then the government, yeah. in wisdom, about four or five years ago, they said, right, we're going to make it a level playing field for everybody. We're going to make it five weeks to make it fair to everybody, which yeah. obviously made it totally unfair with people with pets because the landlord's saying, why should I rent to this person with a five week deposit with two dogs a cat? And the other person's a single person. They're going to pay the same deposit. The wear and tear is going to be different. So it's all very, it's all very uh, tough. Um, question from Samsung SM. Purchasing property, explain the leasehold aspect. I think there's a very north-south divide. I don't know much about the south, but I've had a few people moving from London worried about leaseholds. Um, generally, in the north, leaseholds are quite low, somewhere from like £8 per year. So it's not a huge aspect. The only way, only reason when it is, is if it's under 100 years. So that's one thing to consider. If it is a property you're looking at purchasing, um, check the length of the leasehold. Um, they're generally 999 years, and they may be 60 years old, the property. So there's 930 le years left on the lease, at which point it's not really an issue. It's just if it's a short lease or it's there's any kind of stipulation in the legal pack or the uh vendor pack which mm -hmm. so i don't know about the south i know it's quite different down there isn't it mark so yeah i mean it it would never really normally get down to something where the rent 
the, sorry, the lease would actually expire. Anything below 70, 80 years, you'd either then have to become a cash buyer or you would just negotiate for a new lease as part of the purchase price. But it, it, it takes a long time to get to that situation. Um, and it would always, it's a very, I think it's an actuarial valuation that's carried out to quite a complicated fee process to what that lease would cost. But you would put it into the um, negotiations of, Rather than paying two hundred thousand pounds, you'd pay two hundred twenty thousand pounds and get a new one hundred twenty-five year lease or something like that. So you would start um, new from that. So um, I think we've we've got a question from Mervin that would like to come in. Yeah, Mervin. how Hi, are Mervin. you? And uh, everybody, it's not really a question. Oh, it's, sorry. No. Uh, I actually wonder why I'd got invited here in the first place, seeing as. Um, I'm not looking for anywhere to rent in the UK at the moment because we've just been through that mincer <laughs> with yourself. You're a special guest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. But if I can add any insight, having just been through this rental process yeah. uh, to, to the people that are on this forum, then then fine. Mm. Yeah, it was it was a twofold decision um, to relocate from South Africa for, ooh, during the course of last year. And I'm talking about my family. It was me initially. I'd been away for 52 years. I am British born. Um, so I've got right of residence here, et cetera, and all the benefits that go with it. Uh, and I was coming back because the majority of my family were here. Now, I had a remaining members of my family in Cape Town, who was a daughter, son-in-law, and two small children. They also decided to come across. We arranged a lot of our stuff independently of one another because the idea for me was to retain my independence, get a property on my own and carry on in my own sweet way with nevertheless being close to family as I could. Uh, my daughter and son-in-law family were going their own route and during the time we were comparing notes all the time. And what we did come up against was the fact that this rental situation, when neither of us were in a position, situation financially to buy a property, but the rental situation was going to be very, very difficult indeed uh, because of the supply and demand situation. Uh, the demand was there and increasing. That was very clear. And the supply was diminishing. So it was a bit of a double whammy there. So we were expecting some sort of difficulty. Now, I got here first back in April, and I contacted many agents, letting agents in, in the area, which is in the south of England, that I wanted to stay. And I was surprised, or perhaps I shouldn't have been, by the offhand manner in which I was treated. Uh, not by all of them. One of them was very good, but the others sort of, it was almost a shrug of their shoulders and say, well, you know, we'll keep you in mind and let you know if we have anything, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, while all that was happening, my daughter and family had got in touch. They'd stumbled across Mark's somehow. Perhaps you can tell me your side of that. Well, Mark, someday, I don't know. But anyway, they did. And we were very grateful for it because they were getting expert and very professional and useful advice um, from mark before they even got here now what i'd found when when they got here the 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 actual independence of me and them being separate was probably not the sensible way to go it's still the long-term thing we want to do but we needed somewhere to live and we decided to pull financial resources and find a place together because i could help reasonably well with the uh, share of the rental my son-in-law didn't have a job yet my daughter didn't have a job yet so finances were an issue and actually getting through all the references credit references that we had to when we were doing viewings and accepting quite a lot of them it was myself and my daughter running around half the south of england just getting onto lists for viewings and so often they were so long I went to one agent, the first agent I ever went to, and it, he had a clipboard there with about five or six sheets of A4 paper, and each one was full with appointments, viewing appointments, and that was his Monday to Friday 
responsibilities. Now, that was not unusual, I can assure you. So it became very, very difficult just to get a viewing. Mark, in his inimitable manner, came in extremely professionally and usefully. Without him, I don't. we would have taken a lot longer or we'd have got on an aeroplane and gone back to South Africa. I really don't know. Uh, because Mark helped us, helped us tremendously with his expertise, the maturity. I've got a, <laughs> a daughter who is very headstrong. She needs reining in quite a lot. And she gets very impatient if she doesn't get what she wants. And she wasn't getting anywhere to rent. So we had to haul her in more than once. But uh, with Mark's help, it, uh, it worked out extremely well in the end. Um, on a practical level, there's just one thing that springs to my mind. I don't know if it's relevant to, to, to this group or not, but something just to be aware of, apart from the general scenario, which I've just sketched, how difficult everything was. It's a bit misleading when one looks at photographs that agents have put up for properties. Now, particularly coming from South Africa, we have to be get used to the idea that houses and properties in the UK are a lot smaller, rooms are smaller, et cetera, et cetera. However, when you, when you see the photographs and then you actually relate those photographs to what you're being shown, so often it just, it, there's a mismatch, totally. Those photographs, I don't know if they've been taken with fisheye lenses or what, they're <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. so yeah. much bigger, you know, than what you're being confronted with. And that aspect was particularly, or perhaps it's a separate issue altogether. We were looking for a three-bedroomed house, which we eventually got, fortunately. But on the run-up to that, we were shown so many properties, which they said three bedrooms. Uh-uh, no, they weren't. They were two bedrooms with a box room. You know, you, 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 it was very difficult to swing the proverbial cat in one of those small rooms. <laughs> And, and you and, didn't uh, have a cat. <laughs> we didn't know we had a dog we wanted to bring across, but that yeah. proved too inexpensive. We had to make yeah. a decision. Do yeah. we take a rental or do we bring the dog or we'll leave the dog we act back in South Africa where he still is anyway? Shame. That's another story. Um, but yeah, th there it is. We eventually found a place, and it was almost more by default than anything else. It was in, in a new build complex that we're in now, and we'd seen a couple. And we got onto the list and we put in our offer and even paying a year's rent, we offered. No, it didn't work, didn't work at all. And then the agent who had, we'd been, been showing us around here actually phoned my daughter and said, look, we've got a place that you might be interested in because the current tenant is moving out. So we very quickly went around and had a look and said, you know what, this looks perfect in all respects. And... Uh, that was the good news. We ended up more by default than anything else. However, having said that, there was a major effort put in by Mark, who helped us tremendously. We will be forever grateful, Mark. Thank you <laughs> for all the efforts of you and your wife. It, it was you. excellent. But it was difficult and it was stressful for a good two or three months while we were looking around. It, it, it is. And, that, and that's the thing. I mean, two or three months, three months is a quarter of a year. And mm. that's a lot for people to live. We, we tell people how hard it is not to exaggerate because it is, as you know, and, and there were people that were, I know Mervyn you, and you wouldn't, you're happy to share this, I'm sure, but as in people saying, why are we getting turned down for? It's just a family of four with a, with a granddad. And as in like, and you were the, the fuel for it with the, the salary, as you know, as you, as you say, with the income to provide that. But mm -hmm. it was the third adult as such that they would, like they weren't saying it, but they were turning us down, we think, because of that as well. So but they just wouldn't be telling us straight, as it were, because they're English. So they're not going to just tell you they're going to keep quiet about it. But it is it is very stressful and um, appreciate your time with with everybody as well. And, and I think your your wife made another, another client of mine from last year as well, didn't she? The, the kids are in the same class or something. Is that right? Yeah, they are. Yes. Yeah, school just down the road. Incredible. Incredible. So I mean, you're lucky they've just finished bathing next door here and it's a it's an absolute nightmare trying to get them in a bath every night it's <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a nightly occurrence but anyway. well, and, andrew would know that he's got younger kids as well so i'm sure <laughs> oh well, in that case yes you can identify <laughs> yeah. make your life and make you cry every day maybe 
yeah <laughs> absolutely so, yeah but no thank you i appreciate your time and say so we definitely um and we're waiting for this game of beer and these darts that you're you're going to thrash me at probably but yeah we're dead oh, we're, yeah, we've got to do it i don't know about that i don't know about that i've been throwing a dart now for about five years <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay um oh just one thing just totally off, off the cuff i was going to mention this in we're we're lucky enough to be going to cape town next in two weeks time so oh, we're lovely. going to meet Excellent. zang zanska who does all our social media going to meet Dirk as well which would be great looking forward to meeting Dirk again we've met in England already um mm -hmm. I'm meeting somebody else on the list here that they know who they are there's been a suggestion where to meet so we're going to meet them as well so looking forward to that if there's anybody else in and around Cape Town uh or Mossel Bay where we're going to I think we're we're, we're going for, for the, the game reserve and then back to Cape Town anybody in there that either wants to try and meet up or possibly have a conversation if you want to more than happy whilst I'm over there if we have the time if we have the chance to be on the same time zone we're only two hours difference anyway so it's not that such a massive time but um in general I was going to just drop that in so here we're going with my stepdaughter who's from Johannesburg so she speaks Afrikaans and um and things so yeah we should uh we can't can't wait to see a lot of your people on the, the list here beautiful country so I t talk to people all the time from it but to me to physically be there will be like great so we can't wait for that so looking forward to that but thank you thank you Bevan, for your comments there it's really appreciate it. no no problem if you want a tour guide to show you around i'm going to play yeah. my airfare i'll come back with you <laughs> <laughs> we might do yeah <laughs> exactly oh dear any any other questions from anybody else or we need it with, i'm aware we're up to about an hour now and i, I think more than an hour always takes it a, the toll from everybody to be fair but any other questions from anybody or are we wrapped up did anybody want to see the screen again with our contact details if everybody wants to not um oh yeah can you just share the screen again yeah yeah Dirk, are you happy for me to put yours i know on the slide above it's got your email yeah, I don't know if that slide has it, um, Andrew, but I'll, I'll pop it in the chat box as well. Uh, there you go. Oh, there you see there as well. Say, yeah, brilliant. Hopefully. Yes, I'm happy to. I think I think Mark. Just before we end off, one 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 thing you know that I that I hear a lot from clients, you know, is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Is obviously these right to rent checks that that gets applied in the UK. Um, and, and and that's more you know from a from, from, from people going on a, over on a visa you know so so uh, if I may from an immigration perspective just you know quickly touch on that so if you if an estate agent in the UK or landlord or, you know ask you for your right to rent that is something that you'll only be able to prove once you're in the UK and you've received your biometric residence permit um, and and the reason why I you know, specifically mentioned this is to to, to fall in with the services that that Mark and Andrew, you know, um, it gives in this in, in this aspect. I think I had about one or two clients, Mark, I can't recall the client's name now, but that also, you know, they they try to or you guys managed to get them a property before they were even there, and then you guys negotiated with the landlord slash agent to just wait a bit, you know, hold on, they will be on this and this and this date, and they will then get their biometric residence permit to prove the right to rent. I think that is also one of the very 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 good um you know services that you guys can render to the clients because if you if, if a client goes directly to an estate agent chances are they're going to ask them where's your right to rent if they say they don't have it yet they're coming to the uk they're going to say sorry I can't help you um so so just, just one aspect to um to take into account there guys and um, that's on the on the call tonight it's um the right to rent thing is unfortunate that you something that you cannot get around if they ask you for your right to rent it's only going to be available if you're a british citizen irish citizen someone with permanent residence or you're already in the uk on your visa okay thank you Dirk, and uh, yeah thank you for, thank you everyone for for your time this evening hope hope you found it useful um I think myself and Mark trying to be an open book. Any questions are obviously welcome. And uh, <clears throat> we're just trying to give as much information to anybody and ask us any questions. We're not, we're not it's all about us having new clients. If we'd rather people contact us and message us and speak to us just in case there's a problem with anybody. If, we, if people are worried about things, then we just want to make sure they're happy. We're not getting ripped off by anybody, basically. That's the thing. So, yeah. But, um, but appreciate all your time, everyone. Thank yeah. you everyone with all your comments as well. Appreciate it. <laughs>
Yeah. Thank you. And, yeah. and enjoy the, the rest of your evenings and your mornings wherever you are all over the world. Yeah. Okay. Sunday on the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <David. laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye for that. Right, Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.